It's a pleasure to introduce a, a topic of research that is gaining a huge amount of traction internationally and I think holds an enormous amount of promise for public health. Um, and of course, this is just to put it in the context which we are all very much aware of and I don't need to elaborate on. But making the point that in September The Lancet published the burden of disease um, outcomes showing that unhealthy diet and the associated hypertension are the leading, leading cause of early mortality, a leading risk factor for early mortality worldwide. And of course feeding into the NCDs which are the leading cause of mortality worldwide. But what's also important is that mental and substance use disorders are the leading global cause of disability. So here we have depression, these are anxiety disorders, they're known as the common mental disorders because they're very common. This nosology also includes neurodevelopmental disorders. It doesn't include neurodegenerative disorders, but these are also incre increasing in terms of their burden because of the ageing population globally. What hasn't been considered, what hasn't been taken into account in the estimations of the costs associated with unhealthy diet is the fact that these two things are linked. Unhealthy diet, mental disorders, neurodegenerative disorders are actually linked. And this is what I'm going to briefly discuss today with a focus on the early life period. Um, so 2010, um, I published this study. I was very fortunate to be kind of the first in, in the area. Um, this was my PhD and it looked at the relationship between overall diet quality and common mental disorders clinically determined in a large representative sample of women. So this has really kick-started a lot of work in the area. And in that time, since 2010, we now have a very well-developed and consistent evidence base from the observational data that tells us that unhealthy diets are linked to the prevalence of and the risk for uh, particularly depression. Healthy diets are protective and we now have uh, some very nice meta-analyses, systematic reviews and meta-analyses to show this. Now this is the case across cultures, across countries and across age groups. And this is key because a healthy diet in Japan looks different to one in Norway, to one in Spain, to one in Australia, and yet they have at their heart a higher intake of nutrient-dense foods, fibre, etc. What is more um, consistent across the globe, of course, is what the Western unhealthy dietary pattern looks like, and that's because it's coming from the one source, which is industry, and, uh, and really feeding into um, these Western dietary patterns and the ill health that go with them. But we've done a lot of work in adolescence, and adolescence is a particularly um, important period for mental health. Half of all mental disorders start before the age of 14. Um, as well as leading the International Society for Nutritional Psychiatry Research, in Australia I lead the Alliance for the Prevention of Mental Disorders. And so this idea that you might be able to um, step into a, a space that is really largely empty at this point and look at ways in which we might develop population level uh, universal prevention strategies for mental disorders in the same way that we attempt to do for physical disorders, tells us that diet as a particularly modifiable risk factor uh, may be an important target. So we've done quite a few studies. I'm just going to briefly go across some of them here. This is one that we did in collaboration with the Murdoch. Approximately 7,000 adolescents from around Australia showing that uh, their dietary habits were very clearly linked to their um, likelihood of having uh, adolescent depression. Now in this particular study we were able to take into account a wide range of potentially confounding variables, which of course is important. I should point out that this has also been done very extensively in the adult literature. We've looked in quite a lot of detail at the possibility of residual confounding, SES, income, education, um, other health behaviours, etc. That doesn't explain the, the links that we see between diet and mental health. Reverse causality doesn't explain the links that we see. And uh, in this particular one, we were able to take into these, account these familiar factors that are also very important. We've done prospective studies. This is one with the WHO Collaborating Centre for Obesity Prevention, where we saw that dietary patterns predicted mental health, both cross-sectionally and over time. Um, in uh, Victorian adolescents, we've done studies in, in London, very socially deprived areas of London, and showed that diet still comes up as a risk factor, even in the face of very severe social problems. So this is, again, quite well established in adolescents that diet quality is related to their likelihood or risk for mental disorder, uh, particularly depression, common mental disorder. Now again with my prevention hat on, I'm very interested in the intergenerational transmission of disease and how we might actually uh, again prevent and prevent the next generation um, having an increased risk of mental disorder. 
I'm very interested in this. The Barker hypothesis and the, bar the data from the 80s tell us that early life nutritional exposures are important to the risk for adult disease, particularly cardiometabolic disorders. We, uh, there were very many extensive animal data to suggest that what um, uh, the nutritional exposures during um, development in utero and in early life are related to factors that um, are also in turn related to the risk for mental disorder. So aspects of um, brain development, um, neuro uh, the dopaminergic and opioid systems, so the reward systems, serotonergic systems, etc. So we wanted to see whether there was a relationship between very early life nutritional exposures and mental disorders in um, a large cohort of uh, mothers and their children. So we had data from NASAD in the US to look at um, this in the very large MOBA cohort study. We looked at data from 23,000 mothers and their children. And we looked at mother's diets during pregnancy, we looked at children's diets over the first few years of life, and we modelled the trajectory of um, emotional regulation, markers of emo emotional regulation that are linked to the risk for mental disorder. Um, from 18 months to five years. And what we saw was that there were very clear relationships between exposures during pregnancy and in early life, nutritional exposures and the kids' um, mental health outcomes. So this was published in JARCAP, which is one of the leading journals in uh, paediatric research. And here you can see the data that we're able to take into account as particularly explanatory. Uh, potential explanatory variables. And this is a summary of the findings. So higher intakes of, or higher scores on an unhealthy dietary pattern during pregnancy were consistently linked to higher externalizing, um, externalizing behaviors over 18 months to five years. But the kids' diets were also important. So the kids who were having lower intakes of nutrient-dense foods and or, and these are independent relationships, higher intakes of unhealthy foods consistently had higher levels of these um, emotional dysregulated behaviours. Now importantly, this has now been replicated in two other really uh, good quality cohort studies in ELSPAC in the UK and the Generation R study in uh, the Netherlands. So it's really backing up what we see in the animal models, that what happens during pregnancy in terms of diet is relevant to children's mental health outcomes, not just their physical health outcomes. Uh, these are the Generation R study and ELSPAC, and these will be available in the, um, in the pack. And I mentioned here some of the animal studies. I can't go into them in detail, but you'll be able to read them when you look at the presentation. But these are just a few. There are many, many data to show this. And of course, we know in Australia that um, children's dietary intakes are suboptimal. And again, I don't need to go into detail about this. So we want to know what the biological pathways are that really mediate these relationships so that we can target interventions and you know understand how things are working we think inflammation and oxidative stress are really important so immune function um, this is linked to the risk for, for depression in particular brain derived neurotrophic factors so the neurotrophins and brain plasticity particularly as they relate to the hippocampus is important epigenetic pathways and the gut microbiota which is an increasing uh, area of, of uh, information Brain plasticity, very important. So many, many animal data tell us that you can manipulate uh, levels of neurotrophins and have an impact on hippocampal dependent um, cognitive functioning, learning and memory. The hippocampus is key to learning and memory, but also very important in mental disorder. And we generated the first data in humans. These were published last month, showing that uh, dietary patterns were linked to hippocampal volume in older adults. So you can see here the age-related decline. This is at baseline, this is four years later. So you can see that there's an age-related atrophy, which is normal. But this is the group poor diet, average diet, and good diet. And these were very clearly linked. And in fact, the dietary patterns, uh, the variance was equivalent to about 60% of the age-related decline in hippocampal volume. So it wasn't a tr trivial amount. It gave rise to some very interesting headlines around the world, but um, I've often said junk food rots your brain, so it was nice to be able to publish some evidence to support that. The gut microbiota, really important a new area of research right around the world, huge potential for health. We know that uh, many microbes live on us, 90% of our cells are microbial. Most of our genetic material, in fact, is, is non-human. Very important in driving metabolism and body weight, the immune system, but also mood and behaviour. And I can't go into a huge amount of detail here, but other than to say that the factors, apart from age and geography, um, are highly modifiable and these influence the gut microbiota. So stress, medication use and diet in particular. You can modify the composition of the gut microbiota within 24 hours by modifying diet. 
Um, and this again tells us that potentially uh, the gut microbiota are one of the primary pathways by, by which environmental exposures are transduced to a risk for disease. Um, the key thing is that the gut microbiota in babies in the first um, period of life seems to drive brain development. It also drives the development of the immune system. Now babies get their microbiota from their mother. This points to the critical importance of trying to ensure that mother's microbiota, gut health, vaginal microbiota, which seeds the baby, is as healthy as it can be. Uh, there's animal models to suggest that you can actually intervene to um, uh, rescue some of the phenotype of autism spectrum disorder using um, microbiota approaches. Um, again, I'm not going to go into these because we don't have time, but the other key point is that if we're thinking about the intergenerational transmission of disease, the physical health of the parents before and during pregnancy seem to be very clearly related to the risk for mental and neurodevelopmental outcomes in kids. So for example, gestational diabetes is linked to an increased risk of schizophrenia. Metabolic conditions are linked to autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. This is in the mothers. In the fathers, overweight and obesity is linked to um, autism spectrum disorders. So the health of the parents is really critical, but of course by the time they get to the childbearing years, it's usually too late. They're already overweight. They already have these metabolic conditions. We need to be starting much earlier. So we've written quite a bit about this. We're just starting a trial um, in collaboration with the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and some of the researchers there where we're targeting um, women coming into the third trimester of pregnancy, taking a very gut-focused approach, dietary approach to try and improve their diets with the aim of improving their own gut microbiota and then hopefully that of their children. So the key point is that if we want to intervene to prevent mental disorder and this intergenerational transmission of disease, we need to make sure that uh, these adolescents and early adults are in a healthy state. And that means we really have to start right back here. Um, okay, so here we go. Diet, alcohol, smoking and, and physical activity and cannabis use, these are all critical to, um, to target. This is a really important understanding, of course. You know, this is, goes back to this use of dietary patterns rather than focusing on individual nutrients. You cannot just supplement your way ar around this. You know, supplements are just not equivalent to a healthy diet in terms of health outcomes. So we need to be focusing on diet. We need to be taking population level approaches. So if, we need, if we're going to be able to address the global burden of disability that's associated with mental disorder, we really need to be looking at diet as well as other measures. Um, the International Society for Nutritional Psychiatry Research I've mentioned, uh, we founded this in 2013. It now has more than 200 members from across the globe, Harvard, Oxford, etc. It's free to join at this point. Please email us if you would like to do so. We're having a meeting in Amsterdam next year and a large international conference in Washington in 2017. We've had a couple of key papers published this year really saying, okay, now we know that diet and mental disorder are linked. Uh, this is a really important understanding that will allow us to hopefully intervene uh, with population level prevention and treatment strategies. We had our consensus statement published uh, a bit earlier. And now for the first time on the basis of the work we've done, uh, the US Dietary Guidelines for American Scientific Committee has recommended that they consider uh, neuropsychological health um, when they're thinking about the dietary recommendations as well as somatic disease. Physical health, mental health, they're two parts of the same whole. They shouldn't be dichotomised. We need to be focusing on physical health if we want to improve mental health at the population level. Mm -hmm.